Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about Japan or Nippon or... <laughs> Well, anyway, we're going to be talking about some country names. Names of places is what we're focused on today. Before we start, though, we wanted to say thank you to some new and recent Patreon supporters. First, thank you so much to Andre Baltuta and Charles Berman, who have become new patrons since the last time we recorded. Hooray! Thank you. <laughs> and also thank you to Dan Lizotte, who has increased his pledge. And we thank him very much. Dan is a great <laughs> friend online and supporter and has been very generous to us in many ways over the last uh, couple of years. Thanks, Dan. All right. I think that's it. So let's launch right in. What are we going to talk about today, Mark? Well, today we're going to start off with the name of a country, Japan, and uh, first of all, look at where it comes from. But we're going to then move on into looking at how that country name came to refer to other things rather than the, just the country itself, in particular, stuff that comes from the country. Right. Before we do that, then, we should just have our cocktails, talk about our cocktails, mm -hmm. and then we can... So what we're going to do is listen... This is a, a this is an old video, yes, right? Yes, that's so, right. So we're, let's talk about our cocktails, then we'll listen to the video, and then we'll talk about some more stuff. All righty. Let's talk about your cocktail first, because it makes the most sense. Right. <laughs> so this is a rising sun cocktail, mm -hmm. the rising sun, and it is sake, orange juice, and a little grenadine. Mm. Can I try it? Yeah. Too? I'm going to drop that on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big full glass, that one. It's mostly orange juice, though, I guess. Mm. Yeah, but the sake is very... You can taste the sake for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. The orange juice I made with the clementine, so it's quite uh, light mm. orange juice. That's tasty. Mm. And it's very pretty with the grenadine in the bottom of the glass, like a tequila sunrise. Yeah. But with sake. Yeah. Basically. I suppose that's probably why it's called what it is. Yes. <laughs> but appropriate, of course, as we will soon hear. All right. And I am drinking a Red Dragon, which is a drink in honor of whales, which is partly for reasons that will become clear as we continue with the podcast and partly in honor of St. David's Day, which has just passed. Mm -hmm. I would cheers to whales in Welsh. But I would butcher any possible <laughs> version of any Welsh word, and I don't want to be so disrespectful. So, well, we're going to have to ha handle a few Welsh words today. So, you are <laughs> <laughs> not I. Uh, this is gin, Grand Marnier, blood orange juice, and a little bit of grenadine mm. Mm. and lemon juice. Mm. Also tasty. I mean, orangey, which is really no surprise to anybody. You're a big fan of blood orange juice, of course. Mm -hmm. Rather stronger than your sake yes. cocktail. Yeah, it's good. All right. So Japan and Wales, we're ready to go. All righty. All right. Let's hear about Japan, its name, and some history. At first glance, the name Japan appears to be a simple exonym, a place name used by those who live outside the area, not by the inhabitants themselves but the etymology is slightly more complicated than that. Around 600 CE, the imperial correspondence of the Chinese Sui dynasty began to refer to the region, which had earlier been called Wa, with the phrase Ji Pun, or perhaps pronounced more like Nyet Pun at the time, meaning the sun's origin, because the archipelago, relative to China, was where the sun appeared to rise in the morning, in other words, to the east. So letters were exchanged between the sunrise country and the sunset country. The sun became a significant symbol in Japanese culture, as would later be reflected in the Japanese flag. In 670 CE, during the Tang Dynasty, Japanese scholars of Chinese adopted the name, with the Japanese pronunciations of the kanji characters, also borrowed from China, which, after a series of sound changes, became Nihon and Nippon, both pronunciations used today. This is what lies behind the more poetic English phrase, Land of the Rising Sun. Odd, then, that the name the Japanese themselves use is from an external perspective, looking east, but not surprising that later the Chinese reborrowed the name to refer to the country. It's from the Chinese version that the name first makes its way to Europe as Chipangu through Marco Polo, whose writings about his travels through the exotic Orient, itself a word from a Latin root that means to rise, so the same sunrise idea, 
captivated European readers throughout the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. The Europeans were looking east in the first place for valuable spices and silk. Then, when Portuguese traders finally managed to find a way to sail to Asia, they picked up the Malay version of the name Japang, which had again been borrowed from the Chinese, and it finally arrives in English in 1577 as Japan. During the 16th and 17th centuries, many luxury goods, such as silk and porcelain, made their way back from China and Japan, and lacquered furniture in particular became all the rage in Europe. The so-called Nanban trade period of open trade in Japan from 1543 to 1614 saw a two-way exchange of culturally influential trade goods. Most notably, Japan received the European arquebus gun from the Portuguese, which became known as Tanegashima, after the island where it was first introduced to the Japanese, who already had some basic cannons from the Chinese, but for whom the muzzle-loading matchlock firearms were a major technological leap forward. Having received these weapons from the Portuguese, however, they promptly improved on the design, improving their range, accuracy, and power. They were already excellent metalworkers, making some of the best swords in the world, and used their lacquer work technology, which you remember became so popular in Europe, to waterproof the guns, allowing them to be fired in the rain, which would have rendered the European arquebus useless. What's more, they started mass producing them, by some estimates outproducing European countries. See here for the full fascinating history of guns in Japan. The Portuguese also gave Japan a food which today is thought of as typically Japanese, deep-fried battered tempura. The name itself comes from the Portuguese word tempero, which either means seasoning from the Latin tempero to tempero mix, or comes from Latin tempus, time, in reference to the time of Lent, Fridays, and other holy days when the eating of meat was forbidden, leading to the popularity of deep-fried fish and vegetables since it was Portuguese Jesuits who introduced the dish to the Japanese. Either way, Latin tempero probably ultimately comes from tempus in any case, in the sense of timeliness and restraint, and goes back either to an Indo-European root meaning to stretch, or to cut, in the sense of a segment of time. In Portugal to this day, there's a dish known as peixinhos da horta, meaning fishies of the garden, which is actually fried battered vegetables thought to resemble fish, Though as it turns out, the Portuguese probably got the recipe in the first place from Goa, India, where there is a dish known as pakora, meaning cooked small lump. There are also a number of recipes for actual fish battered and fried in the Mediterranean, such as Spanish pescado frito, fried fish, and escabeche, which probably also gives us the word ceviche, from Arabic as sikbaja, itself from Persian sikbaj, from the word sik, meaning vinegar though this dish actually started off as sweet and sour beef, before being changed by the sailors who spread it to fish. This dish may also lie behind British fish and chips, which is traditionally served with malt vinegar. But since Japanese tempura contains both fried seafood and vegetables, it may be a combination of the two culinary traditions. Talk about international fusion cuisine! This brief period of open trade between Japan and Europe that allowed for all this cultural and technological exchange ended, however, with the Sokoku Exclusion Edicts and the isolationist Edo period that followed. But getting back to that lacquered wood furniture, it was in such high demand and was so costly to ship back to Europe that attempts were made to reproduce the effect, which became known as Japanning, even though the style in question, Japan Black, often came from China rather than Japan. One such substitute was invented in about 1730 by Thomas Allgood of Pontypool, Wales, using turpentine made from the local oil shale, which had the additional benefit of being fast drying. As it happened, Pontypool was also a major iron producer, and since much of the timber in Britain at the time was being used for shipbuilding, Allgood instead started using his Pontypool Japan as an innovative way to rust-proof all that local iron, which was needed because Germany had recently developed tin plating threatening to leave British manufacturing behind. Later still, this became useful for the automotive industry, as Henry Ford began using the innovation of the assembly line to good effect, producing the Ford Model T, the world's first cheap mass-produced car, and the finish he preferred was that old Japan Black, since it dried faster than any other color finish, leading him to make the now famous joke, any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, so long as it's black. The irony of all this is that today it's Japan that's known for its innovative robotic automotive assembly lines, and China that's famous for its cheap mass production industry. So technological improvements and mass production, just like those guns in 16th century Japan. And once again, as with the spice and silk trade, the West is looking East. 
So first of all, a couple of shout outs first to YouTuber Jamzy, uh, who was the inspiration for this video. Mm. He was at that time traveling in Japan and was posting videos on the go, including uh, one about Europeans in, J in Japan and one about guns in J Japan. Mm -hmm, which you reference yeah. in, in that uh, voiceover. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put a link in the show notes to his uh, video, the whole series on Japan. Yeah. They're really good. The uh, short little videos. Yeah, yeah, short little videos. Yeah, so I sort of I made this one as a kind of little tribute to him, and he was well, and as a com and as a companion, wasn't it? it? Well, it was sort of designed to go go along mm -hmm. with them, and then he he was kind enough to link back to our videos yeah. in yeah. in some of his, his videos. So so that was good. Also, a shout out to Cynical Historian, uh, who did a video called Hollywood Guns and History: Common Misconceptions. Oh yeah. And so again, some of my uh, gun knowledge came from that video. Right, right. That was long before you knew him. It was before I knew him. Well, I sort of, you know, I had one or two brief interactions, interactions with, him. Right. with him. It was before I knew him well. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we have I've since been, got you know, to know him yeah. and uh, his work has done nothing but get better and, well, not better, but get like continue to be great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check out his channel if Absolutely. you haven't. Uh... So uh, I have uh, some things to add to mm -hmm. the information in in that little voice over there, stuff about Japan, which I'll get to in a minute. But I'm actually going to start with the the arquebus, mm -hmm. the gun. So as I mentioned in the video, the the European arquebus uh, first arrived in Japan in the hands of the Portuguese aboard. It, they were actually aboard a Chinese ship, hmm. and that ship came ashore on the island of Tanagashima, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1543. Well, the first thing they did was arrange for a little demonstration of the guns. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did some duck shooting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the lord of the island was impressed from what he saw and purchased the guns at great expense. And then after a few initial technical hiccups, mm -hmm. uh, they started then manufacturing them for themselves and even improving on the design. Mm-hmm. And it's important that those European guns arrived in Japan when they did, because this was during a time of civil war called the Sengoku period, mm -hmm. which was from around 1467 to 1603. And that period had ended with the, the Tokugawa shogunate and the ensuing Edo period, a time not only of isolationism, but relative peace, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, much has been made of the fact that the Japanese henceforth gave up on firearms and returned to the sword. So it was also a time of kind of going back to traditional values. Mm -hmm. So that when the Europeans kind of barged in again in 1854, when Commodore Matthew Perry led the U.S. fleet to forcibly reopen Japan to relations and trade, even <laughs> though they were, you know, they wanted mm -hmm. to be isolationist, they seemed to have at that point little knowledge of firearms. Hmm. So they'd sort of stopped using them right. and kind yeah. of forgot about them. And I want to read a quote from Noel Perrin's book, Giving Up the Gun, Japan's Reversion to the Sword, 1543 to 1879. And specifically, this addresses the Japanese improvements to the Port Portuguese arquebus. Mm -hmm. Quote, they developed a serial firing technique to speed up the flow of the bullets. They increased the caliber of the guns to increase each bullet's effectiveness, and they ordered waterproof lacquered cases to carry the match locks and gunpowder in. Japanese gunmakers were busy refining the comparatively crude Portuguese firing trigger pull. They also devised a gun accessory, unknown so far as I'm aware, in Europe, which enabled a match lock to be fired in the rain. Right, which you referred to. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, that's another example of a a trade good that takes its name from a place. It, right. The, the, the gun itself, the gun yeah. The gun itself. was called a, after the island uh, it was after introduced After the island, to. Uh, Tanagashima. Now, as I was saying in that voiceover, of course, it went the other way, referring to an important trade good in England mm -hmm. that came from Japan. So uh, I'll say first a little bit more about the etymology of Japan itself. Okay. So the name is sometimes more fully given as Nippon Koku, sort of meaning uh, the state of Japan. That's kind of more the, I guess, the official name Informally, of the country or whatever. Right. And this might be reflected in some of the early versions of the name in Europe. So the Marco Polo version, Chipangu, that gu at the end, right. may be coming from that koku. Right. 
suffix. Now, there are conflicting stories. I sort of simplified a few things there, but there are conflicting stories as to who first started to use the phrase meaning son's origin to refer to the region. Mm -hmm. So according to the American Heritage Dictionary, it was Japanese scholars who had studied Chinese who began to use the phrase around 670 CE. So that's during the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Henry Dyer, who wrote the book Japan in World Politics, a study in international dynamics, published in 1909, uh, reports that in 607, which is during the Chinese Sui dynasty, the emperor of Japan is supposed to have sent a letter to the court of China with the greeting, a letter from the sovereign of the sunrise country to the sovereign of the sunset country. Right. And then there's another story that claims that it was the Chinese empress, Wu Zetian. And I hope I'm pronouncing that some, somewhere close probably to correct, not. but probably, probably not. not. Just, just accept yeah. that you are <laughs> almost certainly not, but go on. <laughs> um, so she's from the later Tang dynasty. Mm -hmm. And it was she, uh, according to the story, who ordered the change of name. Okay. So I have no idea which is the correct story, but no. <laughs> those are the stories. We are that... not really equipped to judge between those stories. <laughs> Now, as I said, the sun is an important cultural symbol in Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, the sun is one of the most important deities in the Shinto religion and in Japanese mythology. Mm -hmm. the The sun goddess, and again, I hope I get this right, but Amaterasu. Okay. And supposedly, the emperors of Japan were held to be descended from her. Right. So it was a very central, which is important certainly goddess. not unusual in. Uh, semi-divine dynasties around the yes, world, yes, descending that's from a very, the sun god. From, is, yeah. Yeah. Now, getting back to Japaning, the, mm. the borrowed word, there's another sense of that verb in English mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with the lacquering. To be Japaned has, also has the slang sense of to be ordained in the church. Really? Yeah. In which church? In, in the Christian church in England. So, in, so in the, the Anglican, Anglican Church, church. The yeah, the Christian Church is not, not a no, that's specific true. enough terminology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, in the Anglican Church. Um, so, in reference to the the black coat of the clergy, mm -hmm. so it's reminiscent right. of the right. the black lacquer um, right. furniture. Okay, from Japan. So it does have something well, to has, do with the yeah. lacquer, yeah. Now, speaking of the Japan metal, that stuff came to be known as Pontypool Japan, or simply Pontypool. So there's mm -hmm. another place, place name that becomes a common noun. So you, you, you'll you hear, you know, you'll see people talk about Pontypool or Pontypool Ware or, you know, that sort of thing. Right. So I did, what I didn't talk about, therefore, was the name Pontypool itself. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be slightly more complicated than I was originally expecting it to be. Mm-hmm. This is one of the things you just spent the last two days researching. <laughs> With, without a definitive answer. I oh, good, say. good. Well, that's even even better. <laughs> so, I mean, it it seems to mean pool, a uh, bridge by the pool. Right, and this is first of all explain where Pontypool is. So Pontypool is in Wales. Right, so an important key point that yes, will not necessarily yes. be transparent to the world. I think I said it in the. Yeah. Well. In, so yes. But it's, it's in Wales. It is in, it is in Wales. Mm -hmm. And so I expected, you know, to have a Welsh was that, name. It was going to have a Welsh origin, and it and it does, at least in part. So the first part, pont, means bridge. So that's from the French. Not no, so it's it comes from the same root, but it's from the same Proto-Indo-European root, but it doesn't actually come from French or Latin directly, as far as I know. It's just exactly the same. Yes. Well, the Proto-Indo-European root is pent. So mm -hmm. yes, it's not far not to go. Far to go, yeah. really. Yeah. So that that route originally meant uh, to go, walk, or tread, as well as a way or a path. Right. Okay. And that becomes Latin pons. Pons pontus. So. Pons pontus, which mm -hmm. becomes it goes into the Romance languages and so forth. It also comes into English through the Germanic branch, and so we get words like path and pad. Okay. And it comes into Greek as well. And so we get the English word through Greek, um, the English word peripatetic. Right. The pat, not the yeah, para. The, peri the para is the aroundabout. Aroundabout. So peripatetic is someone who wanders around. So the pate mm -hmm. is the wandering yeah. part. Yeah. So that's the first part, pont. Okay. Then the e, 
Mm-hmm. The why yeah. is just the definite article, as mm-hmm. far as I can tell. I, and I wasn't able to figure out if there's anything about the, uh, the declining yeah. of it or anything or like that. Or that it's prepositional in any way or something. Yeah. yeah. But it seems yeah, to be a definite article. It, important anyways. point here. Yeah. You do not speak Welsh. You do not really understand Celtic languages. No. 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 And, and actually... It's, <laughs> so you're it's, looking through dictionaries a, and things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it is a big regret of mine because I had the opportunity to take Welsh as a graduate student oh, yeah. you know, and be able to read mit- all kinds of medieval Welsh literature. And I foolishly did not. Well, foolishly, you were learning Old English, Old Norse and Latin at the time. <laughs> it's possible your brain might have exploded and run out your ears if you tried to learn Welsh as well. But when am I going to get that opportunity <laughs> no, ne- again? Never, never. never. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes. <laughs> so, and I would have done Welsh rather than Old Irish, I think. Mm. I mean, Old Irish gets all the glory. It's got all that. Uh, does it? Yeah. Does it? Well, it's got you know famous <laughs> yeah. literary tradition there, but uh, famous Welsh literary but tradition great, too. Yeah, there's some Mabinogian. Great, and yeah, things, there's right? some great Welsh stuff, mm-hmm. medieval Welsh stuff. So it's King Arthur for goodness' sake. Yeah, and it would be you know a really interesting pairing with Old English mm-hmm. because of the contact. So. Anyways. <laughs> so, but you don't know it. Therefore, everything yes. you say about this is slightly suspect. So, go on. <laughs> right. So, all the... the I know s- even less. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, all the resources I checked said about at least the the modern English word Pontypool, mm-hmm. that the pool part just comes from English pool. Okay. And that English word Pontypool pool it comes from an old english word pole which the the origin of that is uncertain but it seems to to go back to a west germanic word and not even a general germanic word but seems to be confined to just west germanic um in the it, with the sense of a a pool or a pond or something along those lines mm-hmm. but it occurred to me that you know and this happens all the time when when Welsh or Irish uh, names get anglicized, mm-hmm. that they just replace an element with a similar sounding English word, even though it may or may not have anything thing. to do with. Yeah. So I was wondering if pool is actually an anglicization of some other Welsh word that has no relation. Mm-hmm. Now, the clearest choice for that seems to be Welsh and I will do my best to pronounce this. So it's 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 spelled P W L L. Right. So it's got several of the most complicated bits of Welsh yes. spelling in it. Yes. So that double L, the the famous Welsh double L, is a voiceless alveolar lateral fricative. Mm-hmm. So I understand technically what it's doing in my mouth. Can you do it? Can I do it? <laughs> we will find out. Um, push. Sure. I don't know. I can't tell you whether you did it right or not. <laughs> so it, it it should be it shouldn't be voiced. Uh-huh. It's voiceless sound, and it's a fricative that you make on the sort of sides, two mm. sides of your tongue. Yeah, the the, the sort of like cl- yeah. Cl- so you put cl- your tongue to the alveolar ridge just behind your teeth. <laughs> yeah, right. And then the W is like a w. It's, it's like it's a, a rounded w- sound. Yeah. W- 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 so pull, pull. No, oh, sorry, I voiced that pull. Right. I don't know how close that is. Uh, Welsh Please, speakers. Please, Welsh. Can <laughs> yes, may our Welsh me? audience, of which we, I think, have a couple, <laughs> yeah. uh, please let us know how poorly we have done. <laughs> well, the odd thing about this is that that word means pool, pond, puddle. So basically, it means the same thing as English pool. Does it come from the same root? Well, maybe. <laughs> but the problem is, no one suggested any kind of Proto Indo European root that they could go back to. So it just goes back to Celtic. So pool just goes back to uh, not even a. a oh, the pool, the Germanic word. Germanic word goes back to only West, really German. West Germanic languages. So it's, it doesn't even go to Proto Germanic, really. Okay. And again, no one suggested where the, you know, the well, now that Welsh word ha- does have cognates in other Celtic languages. In fact, quite a few, like all the most or all or most of the Celtic languages seem to have a, a related word to that. Okay. So what's happened here? Is it a Germanic word that got borrowed by the Celts or a Celtic word that got borrowed by the, right, Germans? the Germans? And because where did that happen? It can when? have just been on in yeah, the British in England, Isles. Because it exists in West Germanic yeah. continental. So dialects. you'd have to go quite far back. 
but there were Celtic people in the West Germanic. There was lots of Celtic yeah, yeah. and Germanic contact in yeah, yeah, France and in, in Germany sort of Gaul and, and, and yeah, Gaul, that sort of area. Mm. So. so it could be could be around from then. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it could just be a coincidence, but it seems a little it's, it's, surprising. It's, it's an impressive coincidence. Yes, but nobody seems to have discussed it that you no. can find. So it's also possible that they could both come from a common source that we don't know about. Right. So right. there are some suggestions that it might be a non-Indo-European substrate. Mm, but it would one have of to them. So it's really Pictish is what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> well, but see, again, it would have to go back quite far. So yeah. some European yeah. Group. Well, I mean, the Picts had to. Yeah. I mean, the Picts didn't grow out of the ground in in northern uh, Germany. No, but it would probably have to have happened on the continent. I know, but that's what I'm saying is they oh, had to come to so England had, right. from okay. Europe, right? Right? They had to get there. I'm totally joking with the Pictish part. I just, <laughs> I just know we don't know Pictish. Therefore, you can always just say, "Oh, well, it's probably mm-hmm. Pictish." <laughs> now, to complicate, we're not this... sure that we're Picts. So, whatever going on. <laughs> well, to complicate this even further, it's also been suggested that there may be some connection to Latin palace. Meaning right, which bog swamp. or yeah. swamp. Yeah, which sounds a lot like pool. Which sounds a lot like pool. <laughs> so it, this word seems to be very widely distributed and for a word that doesn't yet, have a clear... And yet Indo-European nobody root. is willing to call it an Indo-European root, root, which, yeah. I mean, these are, this is where my lack of true understanding of linguistics comes in. Like, why not? Why don't they just look at all those words and go like, well, obviously this comes from an Indo-European root, but I, I believe that there must yeah. be there must be. Well, it would be a question of uh, finding attestations in more than yeah, two and and it probably branches. has to do with the particular patterns of the sound changes that yeah. may or may not match other sound changes of those vowels, for yes. instance, in each of those languages. If they didn't the change the same way, and the consonants, that... if they didn't change the same way that they did in yeah. in other... So you've got a P in all of those languages, which is a bit weird because... Because P's normally a, they change in different that changes. ways. Yeah, so, so I get that, but it's just... This is where, this is where <laughs> intuition and science part ways, because mm-hmm. it just seems like obvious, but mm-hmm. there must be a reason. So I'm going to kind of, you know go out there and say that there may be some non-Indo-European word that all of these languages borrowed from very early on. Mm, okay. And it would make sense, that particular group of languages, because the Celts and the Germans, they were in Yeah, they were in areas. the same. And, and this is a geographical word. Words that have to mm-hmm. do with parts but, yeah, of the landscape, landscape words. are yeah. words that tend to last from previous inhabitants yeah. of that landscape, right. right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. that happens in English with that's where celtic words Mm -hmm. linger in english right is in names for features of the landscape Mm -hmm. so that would make sense it's the right kind of word for that to happen with and the and the latin the italic Mm -hmm. celtic overlap also makes sense because possible there's celtic overlap in latin i mean there's there's well yeah yeah. and i think um indo-europeanists have suggested that there is a sort of celto-italic Gallo-Italic, Common, Gallo-Italic thing, yeah. branch mm-hmm. um, that they separated relatively late in the game. Well, and there's also definitely borrowings too. Yes, there's, there's our our Republican Latin definitely has Celtic words in yeah. it. Yeah, well, definitely. But I mean, that's what I've been taught. Mm-hmm. Is that there are words that are definitely that are probably Gallic or Gaulish, whatever. We'll, <laughs> well, get, we'll, to we'll that. get to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, that was just a... Pontypool. <laughs> <laughs> and and thank you to uh, various people on Twitter. I tweeted about this mm-hmm. um, and got various suggestions and mm-hmm. uh, And Wayward Lou and, and helped you, I think. Yeah. Well, a number of people. And I, I can't remember all of them. So. I know. I just happened to remember the Wayward Lou <laughs> yes, did. So yes. I wanted to mention that. So thank you all. And if anyone listening to this podcast has any further insight, uh, insight I'd love to hear it. So... Speaking of whales, <laughs> let's okay, talk buckle about... in, people. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a ride. So the funny thing about the the name Wales or Welsh is that it is it was originally an endonym which became an exonym mm-hmm. through a really circuitous path. So let's just I know you mentioned them in the videos, yes. but let's just redefine endonym and exonym. So an endonym is the name of a people that the people themselves call themselves. Yeah, it's very <laughs> reflexive. That. Yes. Yeah. So 
you call yourself. This is the name that if you said to someone, what, who are you? Where yeah. do you come from? And they would, they would use this, this name. This is who we are. Yeah. yeah. An exonym is a term that a, another an external group, group, an external group calls a group. Mm -hmm. So who, who are they? Oh, they're the, yeah. whatever. Right. So obviously sometimes they're exactly the same. In fact, many times they're exactly the same, but mm -hmm. sometimes they're not. Yeah. Yeah. So today, Wales and Welsh are definitely exonyms. That's not what the, you know, Welsh people, Welsh call, people themselves call themselves in their own language. In their own language. Mm -hmm. They instead will refer to themselves as, uh, or will refer to, actually it's, it's, it's pronounced the same, but it's spelled differently, but uh, they, they refer to Wales as Cymru. Mm -hmm. And that word comes from Celtic Is a Celtic roots. word, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, so there's two elements there. The first element, com. Proto-Celtic com is an associative prefix that is related to Latin cum, with. Right. right. So it goes back to that same Proto-Indo-European root. And the second element is Proto-Celtic mrogis, M-R-O-G-I-S. Okay. And that means a country or a region. Okay. So it's the with country. Yeah. It makes sense from an interior perspective, right? It's, you know, this is the country that we're all sort of together with. Okay. <laughs> or, or if you think of it more as the people rather than the place, because okay. it was originally refers to the people and then, mm, and then the place. Right. Okay. So we're, though, I guess if it's, the, if it means country or region. I don't feel don't that you explained it extremely well, but I will accept your word for it. <laughs> so this, this word mrogis uh, mm -hmm. comes from Proto-Indo-European merg, which means boundary or border. Mm -hmm. And from that root, we also get the words mark, as in landmark, mm -hmm. and margin, and march, as in the marches. The Welsh marches. The Welsh the, marches. The, I mean, that's yeah. very specifically the yeah. borderlands, right? The borderlands, the borderlands with, mar yeah. with Welsh, which were also marshes. Marshes, yes. And is marsh? does marsh come from march? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I can quickly find because it. I will, uh, okay, I'll vamp by telling why I, the only thing I associate with that is a Brother Cadman mystery, which is set in the Wel Welsh marches. I mean, he's set on the borders of Wales. And I know very little about Welsh history, but he there's a couple of stories that are all about people hiding out in the marshes between Wales and England. And so I just wondered. Probably not, actually. Okay, so it's just a coincidence. It's just a coincidence. Uh, it actually more likely comes from the root mari meaning sea or mori okay uh, so proto dp mori body of water so okay so old english mere right or right. i guess modern english mere yes old english mare right and <laughs> sorry I can't, french i can't tell the difference between old english and modern english words anymore and french mare and right. latin okay. mare yes. yeah yeah. Yes. yeah meaning ocean yeah okay sorry yeah. that was derailing <laughs> you so yes so uh, that's what Welsh people call themselves and what they call their, their own country. Mm -hmm. The English, of course, refer to them as Welsh. Wales and Welsh. And, Welsh. Mm -hmm. and that comes from an Old English word, mm -hmm. so not a Celtic source. It comes from the Old English word Welch, which means foreigner. Mm -hmm. So you can... You so know, that's obviously an exonym. Nobody it's calls an exonym. Them, no. Nobody calls yeah, yeah, themselves yeah. foreigners, yes. And it's, you know, that kind of terrible... Irony of being the referred to as foreigners mm -hmm. by invaders, right? Right. So the Anglo-Saxons, you know, came from outside and basically pushed the Welsh west, mm -hmm. pushed people or, into the west, and they were already in the west, yes. but they they restricted them to the west. They restricted them to the west. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the various um, Britons mm -hmm. took um, over central and eastern mm -hmm. uh, England. Yeah. Yeah. So the Britons, the the Celtic Britons, were consigned to, you know, restricted, restricted to, yeah. to, to the areas to the West, including Wales. And, that and word, then they were called foreigners. And then they were called foreigners. Yeah. So that, that Old English word, Walch, comes from Proto-Germanic Walchas, mm -hmm. which again, just means basically foreigner, mm -hmm. which seems to come from Latin Wolkai. Wolkai. Like so V-O-L? V-O-L-C-A-E. Who were a oh it's, yeah, it's the name of group of a name group. of a tribe yeah, that's not a yeah. that's not a word that's the name of a group okay yeah. so this is the Latin word for a group of people who were Celtic mm -hmm. and where Wolkai comes from is where it starts to get complicated starts to get complicated yes mm -hmm. so 
One theory is that Wolkai comes from Proto-Indo-European Wolkwo, which means wolf, and from which we get the word wolf. Okay. It also becomes Latin lupus. We've looked at this word before in a video, and I guess a podcast as well, the, the reindeer mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm. Another theory is Wolkai comes from a Proto-Celtic word. So it might come from Wolkos, which means hawk, a Proto-Celtic word that means hawk. Okay. Now, both of these you can sort of see making sense as a name for a group of people because they're, you know, fierce oh, yeah. Yeah. animals. You might call yourself the wolves. The people of the wolves. Yeah, the people the of the wolves. The people of the hawks yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. This word wolkos, uh, this Celtic word wolkos, seems to come, may come from, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> proto-Celtic ulkos, which means evil or bad. Okay, so predators. Predators. So mm-hmm. hawk meaning, yeah, a bad thing, a predator, mm-hmm. whatever. Ulkos. Okay, where does that come from? Well, there's, again, some disagreement here. It might come from a Proto-Indo-European root, elkos, which means wound or boil. Okay. <laughs> Which itself may come... Becomes less and less likely to be something you name yourself after, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, the people of the boil. (laughs) Yes. Which may, and here I'm doing a bit of educated guesswork, but it may come from a Proto-Indo-European root, L. So it's just an extension of L. L becomes Mm Elkos. That means, and here the set, we're not entirely sure what this root means, but it seems to become... Indo-European words that mean either hungry or bad. The bad part makes sense, right, from what we, if Mm -hmm. if it produces a proto-Celtic word that means evil or bad. Mm -hmm. The hungry is a bit odd, but that root, either elkos and or el, Mm -hmm. seems to come into other languages as well. So it becomes Latin ulcus, from which we get ulcer. Meaning wound. Meaning wound. Ulcus means wound, yeah. 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 It also... And this just sort of amuses me, uh, my <laughs> ten-year-old boy humor, uh, <laughs> becomes the Sanskrit word arsa, which means hemorrhoids. But not behind, because arsa sounds a lot like arse. It's not at all related to arse. <laughs> it's just completely coincidental. <laughs> but the word is arsa, and it means hemorrhoids. It's that right. idea of a yeah. wound or a boil right, or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, it's great when when language, you know, provides you with humor like that, I think. <laughs> or <laughs> I'm so I'm so lost. What are we talking about? I know now? we're several levels in here. <laughs> this is why it took me so long to, to work this out. You said you were gonna condense it <laughs> to tell the people in the podcast. Or that proto-Celtic word ulkos that means evil or bad might come from wilquo, meaning wolf, anyways. Wait. Okay. <laughs> So no, don't, no, no, there are two, no, that's fine. two ways good. that it might come from wolf, <laughs> okay. basically. Right, okay, great. All right. So the word that means foreigner may come from a Celtic word that means wolf. Yes. Or wound or bad. Yes. Okay. Or. <laughs> I don't like you anymore. Go wolf away. Wolf high coming from that proto-Celtic <laughs> wolkos meaning hawk might come from proto-Indo-European pell. Meaning, no, no, it doesn't. I mean, like, that would just get ridiculous. <laughs> meaning pale. We looked at this word before in our mm-hmm, color series, mm-hmm. which gives us words like pale and pallor and falcon. Right. So that's why the hawk, hawk thing, right? right? Yeah. So falcon because it's a sort of pale colored bird. Mm-hmm. I'm drinking. <laughs> <laughs> unless. Maybe I should just start drinking like every to, time you, know, you say this or, a, or a, unless. A mathematical <laughs> equation because... <laughs> Unless falcon instead comes from another Latin word, falco, well, Latin, rather than, so falcon is a Germanic word, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And might go back to that Proto-European word. Unless that Germanic word, falcon, is borrowed from Latin falco, which means falcon. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't seem reasonable at all. <laughs> and that Latin word, falco, comes from another Latin word, falx. Meaning curved blade, yeah. pruning hook, sickle, war right. saw, whatever, yeah. you know. Curved so, blade. Basically. Curved, curved yeah. blade. Yeah. Because of the, the talons or maybe the shape of the wings. Or the beak. Or the beak. Has yeah, it could be the beak as well. Beak. Yeah. I would so any of those gone things. For the beak. Yeah. yeah. 
which itself seems to come from Proto-Indo-European delg, which means a needle or to stick, you know, to puncture, to... You know, there's times I feel like this whole exercise of etymology is just a <laughs> ridiculous endeavor. <laughs> We're still not done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that pr- Proto-Germanic root, Walhaz, that we talked about way back. 20 minutes ago, yeah. The foreigner word. Right. It also is the wall part in Cornwall. Yes. So the Cornwall is literally, it means the Corn Welsh. So they were mm-hmm. Welsh, but a specific kind of Welsh, the Welsh who came from the Horn, the promontory, mm-hmm. which is where Cornwall is. The corn part comes from Proto-Indo-European care, meaning horn, and we mm-hmm. get the words horn and cornucopia, that cornus. Unicorn. Yeah. Unicorn, yeah. That same Proto-Germanic word, walhas, also gives us the word gall. Mm-hmm. Unless, though probably not, gall comes from Latin gallus, which mm. we'll talk about in a minute, but probably not. People thought yeah. so at one point, but... Yeah, it that seems was my understanding. That there are the two this, yeah. words which happen to be the same. Happen to be the same, which I know sounds yes. sounds surprising, so we'll get to but that they really minute. don't have very much to do with each other. There's no reason they no. should be the same word. That Proto-Germanic wall has also gives us Walloon, who are a particular group in Belgium, the Walloons, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the ones who do do speak French. They speak French. Yeah, the ones who yes. speak French. Yes, right. and they Meaning presumably they came from, from, from Gaul. The Celtic yeah, so right. that that Gaul um, Celtic kind of background. Mm -hmm. Now, (laughs) before I get into some of those other words, one last point about the word Welsh, Mm -hmm. the modern English word Welsh is, it gives us another English word, Welch, Mm -hmm. which is a, which was a horse betting term, but is basically, it's a slur. So you shouldn't use this word to mean, you know. It means to not follow through on a bet. It means to, it means to. Renege on a bet. Renege, yeah. Yes. So it seems pretty certain that that comes from Welsh and therefore the is, idea is, is that they're, they're it's not an ethnic slur and no. you shouldn't use it. Now, I mentioned Gallus, Latin Gallus, mm-hmm. from which we get the English word Gallic. Mm-hmm. Meaning in English now yes. to do with France. France. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that Latin word Gallus is a homonym with Gallus meaning rooster, mm-hmm. which is why very often you see the rooster used as a symbol for France. Mm-hmm. Because it's a pun, essentially. It's a pun. Yeah. yeah. They're not related, but it's... Uh... But where does Gallus come from? Well, it seems to come from a proto-Celtic word, galen, galen, which means to be able or to mm-hmm. be strong or powerful or whatever, which again, makes yeah, really no, good seems, sense for, for like a tribal a, name, right? Yeah, yeah. The strong ones, powerful ones, which goes back to a proto-Indo-European root, gal, which means to be able to have power. Now, that Proto-Indo-European root produces a number of separate, but therefore obviously related, distantly, words for Celtic people. So not on, only Gallus, the, mm-hmm. the Roman word, but also it becomes Greek Galates, mm-hmm. which we now know as the Galatians, yeah. so mentioned I, in the Bible. And that's particularly interesting because... That's from two different points of contact. Yes. Right? So, so the there's Greeks no indication that the Romans picked up that word that from the Greeks. Related at all. No, 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 and they didn't because the Romans picked up lots separate. of words from the Greeks, but not in this case. Yeah. In this case, the because the Celts moved as people were widespread. They, and then very they moved from east to west. I yeah. mean that that's a, a an accepted fact. They seem to have come from Central Europe and yeah. sort of moved in and various moved directions. In, and and, and yeah. in many different groups mm-hmm. of, you know related tribes who spoke mm-hmm. Celtic languages. And one group of them came into Greece and sort of invaded Greece mm-hmm. in very early, comparatively. Were they the group that went west and then came back east, I believe? Anyway, I don't know the details of it. But And then, then moved in and settled in mm-hmm. uh, places in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, yeah. whom the Greeks therefore knew as Galatians, yeah. which is why we can sort of feel fairly confident in considering this an endonym. Yes. Because, or, you know, or an attempt at rendering an endonym Mm -hmm. because the Greeks saw that, took that name from them. And then separately, the Romans, the Romans met these people who called Mm -hmm. themselves something that the Romans interpreted as Gallus. Yeah. And so we got that. So that's a, and we don't have that for a lot of other groups. No. You know, the, most of the others. Because they are so widespread. Yeah. 
that they kind of in, in yeah. So I just yeah. wanted to make that clear. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so the Galatians of the Bible the and the, of the letters Bible. of the letter to the Galatians from Paul are the same as the Gauls. Yes. In northern Italy and France. Yes. And that proto-Celtic word Gaun also came into Greek as Keltoi, the Celts. Which is the word, the, okay. The other Celts. word that Greeks use to refer to mm-hmm. these people. That's, yeah. And it should be pointed out that Keltoi or Celts historically only referred to a very specific subset. subset. Mm. It was not the general word for all, you know, mm-hmm. the whole... Which was Galloi. Yeah. And it only gained its modern sense, its modern broad sense, in the 19th century. Mm, when people were rediscovering yeah. nationhood in all sorts of complicated yes. ways. So if you talk to, you know, someone in Ireland or Wales or wherever... Um, in the 18th in, in century? The, in, yeah, in the 18th century. And you said, well, you know, you're Celtic peoples. They would not know what you, know were, talking what you, you were talking about. This yeah, is a, a later 19th okay. century scholarly application. Which the then word. broadened and became yeah. a point of national identity. Yes. And that got turned into Celtic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to refer to American basketball teams. Yeah. <laughs> Which come, to be fair, there's the Boston, I mean... The yes, Scots yeah, and Irish, Irish yes. in particular, yeah, yeah, but yes. <laughs> now, to add to all of that, you might be wondering, well, what about Gaelic? Why, yes, Mark, what about Gaelic? I was wondering that. So Gaelic is probably not related to any of these words. <laughs> <laughs> Though, at one point, it was suggested that it might come from Latin Gallus. Gallus right. Because that Gaelic. is, would in the 17th century, would the Scots have referred to themselves as Gales? Gales, probably. Because yeah. that is, that, yeah. I mean, that's that's certainly a term that is still used sometimes. Yes. yes. Okay. So Gale seems to mean wild men. Well, because that's got to be an exonym too then. I guess. Or just but it's a, a point of pride? But it comes from a Celtic root though. Huh. So it comes from proto-Celtic wedu. Mm-hmm. Which means wild or wood. As in I suppose it could be a Celtic woods. name for some group some of group. them, yeah. right? I mean, it's not like the Celts were so unified that they wouldn't have names for each other, mm-hmm. for groups within them. Huh. Okay. So yeah, wild or, you know, woods or wilderness, mm-hmm. which may, I think, and this is, again, me kind of doing some, a little bit of guesswork here, that Celtic root may come from the Proto-Indo-European widu, which means tree or wood, from which we get the word wood. Right. The English word wood. Right. Okay. There's also an old English word wath, which means hunt, a hunt. Mm. And wathan, I think there's uh, a verb of that too, which may come from this same root. Right. Okay. And there are other, uh, there are cognates from the Proto-Indo-European root in, in other languages as well. So the Celtic, but the Celtic branch of that seems to have been a name Hmm. that they may have called themselves. Now, which is why I wonder, so the basic sense here is wild Mm -hmm. or wood, specifically wood, really. But given that the, there's an, possibly an old English cognate that means hunt. Right. So the idea of hunters. Might mean hunters or something or woodsmen or something like that. I can, yeah, that seems more. More or, likely to be. I mean, it could animal. be men of the woods. It could be men like we woods. live in the woods. Yeah, so, it could you be know. that. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? Anyways, that's that's my best guess. All right. <laughs> so that's all the words that come out of Wales and Welsh <laughs> itself. Complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can see why that took me a while to wrap my head around. Yes, and I'm <laughs> could not possibly retell that to anybody else if they <laughs> wanted me to. I could draw you a picture. Nope. Done. <laughs> All done now. Well, speaking of the Gauls, let's talk about the French. (laughs) This is much simpler. Okay, good. So French as an adjective could sometimes mean foreign, you know, similar to... In English. In English. Yes. Yes. So in English, the word French could be used as an adjective that means foreign Okay. or rare, as in French hens from the Mm -hmm. 12 Days of Christmas, which I'd mentioned before. So French hens are basically, you know, foreign birds or rare birds, you okay. know, whatever. Or as in French nuts, which is another term for walnuts. And walnuts, walnuts of course. as we know. <laughs> well, when we don't necessarily know. Explain, no. yes. explain to the people about walnuts, Mark. Walnuts. So walnuts, that, that wall in walnuts also comes from the, the same, same word that, that Welsh comes from. <laughs> 
Welch. And it's probably called that not in reference to whales, though, in, but in reference to gall. So These are walnuts, the nuts from gall, yeah, the foreign so, nuts. Yeah. So Old English walchnutu probably means it means literally foreign nuts, but probably referring to nuts that come from gall mm-hmm. uh, rather than where, the nuts that where? they had there. Right. Yeah. Now, the, the word French comes from the name of a Germanic tribe, the Franks, mm-hmm. who moved into Gaul. Mm-hmm. And so that's why today France is known as mm-hmm. France. Okay. Um, it was originally an area occupied by Celtic Gauls, uh, but it was invaded by a Germanic tribe, the Franks. After the Romans had invaded. After yeah. the Romans had invaded. And the Franks themselves seem to have taken their name from a type of javelin that was their preferred weapon. Mm-hmm. So a Frank is a, a kind of spear, basically. Unless it might have been the other way around, that the, the weapon takes its name from, from the, the people. people. In which case, we don't know where the word comes from. In, in which, in we, well, either way, we don't know where the word comes from. Right, beyond that. Beyond yeah. that. Yeah. In any case, the point being that they were conquerors, right? Mm-hmm. They come in and invade an area and conquer it. So therefore, the word Frank came to mean superior or free in their role of conquerors, right? Mm-hmm. In a, because as, they came in and made came, the other people yeah. unfree. Yes, yeah. So when you speak frankly, you're speaking freely or openly. And the word franchise comes from the same root. It originally meant freedom or liberality. And there's still an echo of that in the word disenfranchised. What do you mean? Well, in that you aren't free. You are... Well, but I mean, the the same word is in franchise. Yes, franchise. But I know, but... (sighs) It is in franchise, but we don't use the word franchise to mean that very often anymore. Now we tend to use the word franchise to mean a business that uh, purchases the rights to use a you know, uh, I think of it as getting the franchise, getting the vote, getting that's but you're right, it is it's true, probably I I'm not always typical. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I think of the word, I mean, disenfranchise seems to me the complicated to, to say we think or that for franchise. Yeah. To enfranchise is to, yes. to give somebody the yeah. vote, give somebody but franchise, power. franchise, I think the freedom. first thing that will pop into people's minds is like a McDonald's. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I just, this, I think of it as to do with the history of voting, um, right. voting rights, but maybe that's a particular concern of mine. Um, you know, when we talk about ancient, the ancient world, who has the franchise, and yes. we talk about the modern world, when women get the franchise, or, yes. and it's all about votes. So, and then to disenfranchise is to disempower yes. because they don't have that freedom. I suspect that doesn't come to, to mind for most people, though. I don't. I could be wrong. I, no, 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 you, you're probably right. But yes, okay. It just uh, seemed weird to have disenfranchise yes. be the primary meaning. Yes. yes. The word franchise, by the way, in Middle English, it's used in famously in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, means sort of freeness, liberality, generosity, Mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. A concept that I know you are fond of. Yes, I am fond of that concept. There's a French... uh, I'm not going to... There is a French word, (laughs) Mm -hmm. ironically, uh, that I feel like means like freedom of speech. uh, uh, Franchement. Ah, okay. If you say it like, which is frankly, same thing. So right. even in yeah. fr- even in, in French, French, it yes. can mean right. to speak, you know, like honestly, I've got to say, franchement, je veux dire, you know. Right, right, right. Like, so yeah, so even in French, it means that. Right. Frankincense is incense that is but that rare or it's superior. The superior. Right? So it's mm-hmm. the superior incense. And I don't know how many people know this term, but franking privileges. I know. I, I mean, I know of it because of, basically because of I've heard this etymology discussed right. before, but otherwise I wouldn't know it. So franking p- privileges are, um, bas- it's basically politicians uh, being able to send out mail for free to their mm-hmm. constituents. Mm-hmm. So speaking of a Germanic tribe, the Franks, let's talk about... <laughs> Germany. Germany. This is a this is okay. you know, famous for Briefly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it is it is the famous, famous exonym endonym yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. so many different words for Germany. Germany itself comes obviously from Latin Germani or Germania, the, mm-hmm. the place, which is interestingly probably a Celtic term for them. So mm-hmm. it's an exonym. Well, and also the Romans were quite poor at distinguishing between Germanic and Celtic groups. Yes. We have a number of places where they called, they thought of people as Celts when they were, and they like there's a particular set when they pair two tribes, and we're pretty sure that one of the tribes is German and one of the tribes is Celtic, but they thought of them as the same, you know, like, so that but they called them both Gauls. Like the Romans were not good at distinguishing between those two groups. They were just barbarians in the Northwest. <laughs> as far as yeah, so we don't know for sure who the Germanic 
they were. Were mm-hmm. they were they actually Germanic a Germanic? They may well not have even been not a Germanic been. group. Yeah, but the word seems to be a Celtic term for another group. Right. And the the Romans sort of specifically, I guess, Caesar picked it up from one Celtic group, anyways, to right. refer to, to another, another people, co- another people near, nearby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's perhaps a Celtic word that means noisy, related to mm-hmm. an old Irish word, uh, garum, to shout. So mm-hmm. the noisy people. So again, it's sort of Doesn't pejorative. It's negative. Or it might come from a Celtic root that means neighbor. So related to Old Irish, gare, meaning neighbor, Mm -hmm. so a neighboring tribe. Or it might come from uh, garum, which means battle cry. This theory was put forward by... It's surely the same as shouting. Yeah, I guess. Right? I mean, that must come from the same... Be ultimately related? Yeah. I suppose. This theory was put forward by Johann Wachter and Jakob Grimm of the Brothers Grimm. Mm-hmm. It's, I think, not generally accepted accepted anymore. But okay. Or another suggestion, and I'm, I have a question about this, but that it comes from a, a root gare that means spear. And I'm wondering if this is related to Old English gar, because that means spear. Spear, yeah. So Seems yeah. like it might be. Seems like it might be. Anyways, so various suggestions, but it seems to be a Celtic word. Okay. Referring to another people. Now, the Germans themselves call them, you know, call themselves Deutsch, which comes from Old High German Deutisch, which comes from Proto-Germanic Theodiskas, which originally meant of the people. So it's just a, you know. Just a word for the people, people, people. which is a very, very Very common common. endonym in many, Mm -hmm. many languages around the world. The name for the people is the people. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to Proto-Germanic Teuta, or sorry, Proto-Indo-European Teuta, the Proto-Indo-European root word that means people that comes in into English in a number of different ways. It becomes Old English theod, which means people. Mm-hmm. So it's a common Old English word to refer to people. Uh, it also gives us the word Teutonic, mm-hmm. which was a uh, fairly common way of referring to Germanic peoples yeah. in the 19th and early 20th century. And again, this comes Teutons. from a Roman name for a particular bunch Group. of Germanic peoples. The, the underlying thing here is there were a lot of different groups in the yes. area we now consider Germany or close to Germany. And each of those groups, the Romans tended to encounter them individually as groups, Uh refer to them by individual names. And then other people too, later on, post-Roman periods also encountered different groups and then generalized the name of one group for the whole country. And that's what, that's the basic pattern, right? So the Germani or the Teutones. It also gives us the word Dutch, obviously, mm-hmm. and Pennsylvania Dutch, who aren't actually Dutch, but it's Pennsylvania German. Deutsch, so it's Pennsylvania German. They're actually right. German, not Dutch. Now, another word that the Romans used for a particular group that has become then used to refer to all of the Germans mm-hmm. uh, is the Alemanni. Mm-hmm. So again, this was another specifically a tribal name for, for the Romans, referring to one tribe of the Germans. Mm-hmm. Um, and that comes from Proto-Germanic uh Almanis, mm-hmm. uh, which probably means all man. It's quite straightforward, that <laughs> right, one, okay. all manis. In which case, it might therefore refer not to one tribe, but some kind of coalition of tribes. Right, sort of like a group, yeah, yeah a super group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though there is another theory suggests it might uh, rather mean foreign men, and that's in comparison to the tribe you just mentioned, the um, the Allobroges. Broges, yeah, Allobroges, yeah. Um, who, which was the name of a one particular Celtic tribe in what is now Savoy. In Latin, it literally means the aliens in reference to their having driven out the original inhabitants of that area. Mm. In which case, the al part is cognate with the first element of Latin alias. Okay, which means other. Other. Yeah, yeah. we don't know, but that's a possibility. But I, I'm pretty sure, sh- I, I, I kind of go with the all-man, you know, confederation like of tribes. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I think that's more likely to my mind. Now, another word that is sometimes used to refer to all the Germans is Saxon. This comes from Proto-Germanic Saxon, which is believed to come from the word sax, which is a kind of a dagger or knife. Mm -hmm. So again, another example of a tribe name coming from a weapon they like to use. Yep. Or a weapon that other people felt was used against used, them. Used against yeah. Them. yeah. <laughs> so therefore, Saxon was a swordsman or a knifeman or whatever. And another possibility is that it might come from a word from the word axe. But the sax, meaning mm-hmm. knife, one is mm-hmm. the one that I think is most commonly 
Okay. Believed. And so for instance, so a number of languages take their their word for the Germans from that, from Saxon, mm -hmm. including the Scottish, who call them the Sazenach. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm responding to that. Uh, you will not know this, but in the fairly widely known and popular series of uh, Outlander, the Outlander right. series, the protagonist Jamie, or the the male protagonist Jamie uses as an affectionate term for his English wife. Right. He calls her Sassenach. So I'm just I'm just Sassenach. echoing the audiobook in my head. Right. I do not I haven't watched the show, but I um I listen to the audiobook. I have no idea if the pronunciation is correct, but that's what I hear in my head when yes. you say that. Yes. So yeah, specifically we're referring to the English mm -hmm. yes. the Anglo Saxons. Yeah. All right. I don't have a lot to add to this complicated set of things, but on the topic of endonyms and exonyms, I just thought I would bring up a couple of classical ones just to, though you've talked lots about Romans already, mm -hmm. so we're, we're doing okay on, on classical stuff, but just so that I have something to say other than pa, which is pretty much when all I've said so, so far tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Some major names in the ancient world are exonyms, mm. like Greek. Greek, right. Greek is an obvious one that is worth mentioning. So Greek and the Greeks in Greece are not the name that people who live in that part of the world call themselves. No. It is not the word for the Greeks in Greek, no. though it has been used, you know, it, it is certainly not unknown to Greek people. So Greek comes from Latin, Greeky. Mm -hmm. And probably from a Greek word itself, so it's not completely unconnected to Greek, Graikoi, which seems to have been a word for a particular group of Greeks right. that they used for themselves. I'm going to sort of quote from Edom Online and the OED. Aristotle was the first to use Graikos as equivalent to Hellenes, so the word doesn't turn up first in Latin. Right. So the Greeks actually called themselves or the modern Greek is Hellenes. Ancient writings, if you look at Homer, for instance, they a just, whole bunch of he uses words. a ton of different yeah. words. Well, because they aren't a, a, unified, they aren't a unified people, people really. Right. But the, probably if you were going to name one group, you would call it the Achaeans. Right. The Achaeans, which really doesn't go on to give us anything. Right. We don't, we don't use that. The Latins don't use that. And the, Roman, and the Greeks of the classical period don't use that for themselves either. So it was a so archaic it's, every different group from a different place. Do we know where any of those come from? I haven't looked them up. They're all place names, right? right. So they're all probably all have different origins, mm. frankly. Uh, so Hellenis is the word in the classical period when they want to. So the Greeks never really thought of themselves in the classical period as all one people. Right. They really didn't. But they did Considered they all spoke the same language and there was sort of something that was Greekness mm -hmm. compared to non Greekness. And they used the word Helles, Helles to, and Hellenes to refer to that. I don't know where that actual word comes from because I don't, I don't have all your dictionaries and I don't look mm. all these things up. But <laughs> they said it came from, of mm. course, Helle, who's a mythological figure, a girl who falls off a ram into the ocean, mm. you know, like you do. The ram that gave us the golden fleece. Oh, right. It fell, fell into the Hellespont. Ah, okay. Hellespont. Thank you. Right so, you know, so they have a mythological origin, which is, un, mm -hmm. you know, um, not just almost certainly, but certainly untrue. <laughs> right. But that's where they, they saw it as coming from. So we don't, I don't know where that specifically comes from, but that is the name they use for themselves. Right. But one group, so Aristotle uses Graikos to mean Greeks. Mm. And he said that it was the name originally used by Illyrians for the Dorians in Epirus. Now, Illyrians are there. So that uh, Illyria is along the coast, the coast and the northern part of the east, eastern coast of the Adriatic between mm. Italy and Greece. So Illyria is there sort of facing Italy. Now, the Illyrian language is related to Greek or uh, is it not? I don't know. Hmm, okay. You're the language person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> I did not spend the last two days preparing for this <laughs> podcast, all right? <laughs> I didn't have that time. I had other things to do. You're welcome to look it up. I will. Epirus is a part of Greece that's on the coast sort of facing Italy. Famous people like Pyrrhus came from Epirus. He was the king of Epirus. And so he says, so Aristotle, there's no reason we have to believe Aristotle, you understand. But he says that the, the Illyrians called the Dorians the Greco 
uh, from Graii, which was the native name of the people of Epirus. So that they called themselves the Graii. Okay. Now that's Aristotle. A modern theory, modern meaning from the 19th century, and derives it from Graikos, inhabitants of Graii, literally gray, old or withered, on the coast of Boeotia, which was the name, at, it's, so that that might be where it comes from. Either way, the people who came and settled in southern Italy. So there were a lot of Greek colonies in southern Italy, in particular in Cumae and other places in the southern Italy right. in the 9th and 8th century BC. Greek people or people from Boeotia and other, uh, it seems to be that possibly colonists from Graia, mm -hmm. if this place is really existed, came and settled that area. And it is certain that the Romans first encountered Greeks in Southern Italy. Long before they encountered them in Greece, they encountered right. them in Southern Italy, right? So whatever the actual ultimate origin of the word Graikos is, what is definitely true is that the Romans first encountered people whose name for themselves seems to have been Graikos, not meaning every person everywhere who spoke Greek, but meaning us, our particular group, uh -huh. right? And so, but they took that and then they generalized it to all Greeks. So the Romans used an endonym of one group as an exonym for, for all Greeks. Right, which is what happened with the German yeah, various words. exactly. So this German. is, I mean, it's a totally natural thing to do, but it's just, it's worth pointing out because, you know, Greek seems to like such a fundamental classical thing for us. But, you know, that's why we talk about the Hellenistic kingdoms and Hellenization right. and all of those terms. They have to do with the fact that that's the actual internal word for Greek. Are you looking up your Illyrian? Yeah. I mean, they are Indo-European. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily seem to have any close connection to, to Greek, to the Greek mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. So, right. so just beyond the, that they're both... That they're nearby. They're yeah. nearby and they're both Indo-European. Right. The Greek, I mean, we know that the Greek language branch is seems to be a surprisingly isolated language branch yeah. of Proto-Indo-European, of Indo -European, yeah. right? Like they don't, they seem to have diverged and they don't seem to be connected that closely to anybody nearby, no. which is one of the weird things about Greek. Okay. So then the Greeks themselves seem to have sort of re-imported the word Graikos and used it sometimes, mm -hmm. but it never really took on a full, the, the, the full term. Okay. So that's one. Another one is Egypt. Yes. Yes. Right. right. So Egypt. So the endonym for Egypt, though, that's a complicated thing because Egypt, uh, you may not have known this, but Egypt has a long history. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a fair number of different people in Egypt mm. and have been. But the basic endonym for Egypt appears to have been, and here we run into the problem that we do not know how to pronounce Egyptian because we don't have any vowels, but KMT. Right. So it's <laughs> usually uh, supplemented to, as Kemet. Right. Kemet. Mm. Uh, the vowels are disputed and mm -hmm. whatever, but Kemet. Whatever, however you pronounce it, what it means is black land. Right. The black land as opposed to the external area of the red land, okay. which is the desert. Right. So Kemet is the black land. That was the actual name for Egypt itself. So Sorry. I guess in reference to... The black the, soil the deposited black by soil, the, Noil, the, the, the Nile. The fertile yeah. soil yeah. as opposed to yeah. the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Egypt was co called themselves Kemet, the black land. And interestingly, the Romans, for instance, seem to have known this whether they knew the actual word Kemet or not, or understood the Pharaonic language, that the old old Egyptian language, they knew that the name of the land meant black soil. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to that in a moment. But so where does the word Egypt come from then? Mm -hmm. We could get it through Greek. The Greeks called it Aiguptos, meaning they use that to mean the River Nile or Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they seem to have taken it from the word hikupta, which comes from Egyptian hatka ptah. So the temple of the soul of ptah, the god ptah. Right. Okay. Ptah is associated with Memphis, the city Memphis right. in Egypt. Therefore, the soul of the city, the temple of the soul of ptah was a name for Memphis, the city. Right. And the Greeks took it as the name of the whole country because, again, they right. sort of so interacted again, with Memphis. Yeah. Broadening a. Mm -hmm. Specific name. So, ha kapta aiguptos. Right. It's a, a deformation of that word, which then came into 
Latin. They yeah. just, just took it as the same word. So we get Egypt from that. But interestingly, as I said, they the Romans anyways, and, and probably the Greeks as well, mm. understood or came to understand that there was a name for Egypt in its own language that had mm-hmm. to do with black soil. And specifically, Virgil has a line in the Georgics where he talks about something that happens in Egypt and he mentions the Nile and he has a line where he says, uh, he describes, Virgil has a line where he describes um, Egypt and he mentions its black soil, its nigra solos. Mm-hmm. So it's a cross-linguistic pun. He doesn't use the word Kemet, and there's no reason to believe that he necessarily knew that word, mm-hmm. but he does use the word Egypt and he describes it as having black soil. So, right. which is something very, very common in the way he uses language. So he's been punning on what someone would know Egypt was called right. with the Latin words that are not in any way, the Latin words are no, in no way connected to, to, the, to yeah. the Egyptian words, right. don't sound like them or anything like that, but they mean black soil. Right. So we have a line in the Georgics that shows that he's pretty much aware of that. So yeah, so that's Egypt. And then the last one I just wanted to mention is Carthage, because it was so important to the Romans. Mm-hmm. And Punic, which is associated with Carthage. I always have to explain to my students, you know, why are there Punic Wars with Carthage? What does that mean? And then that brings us to Phoenicia. So we have a line on in the uh, Servius, a commentator on the Aeneid, says, Carthago est lingua poinorum noa kiwitas. Carthage means in the language of the fin- of the Phoenicians, new city. Which of course makes sense, and indeed Phoenician. So it it comes Carthage comes from the Phoenician. I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Quart Kadash, new town. Right. It was a colony founded by people coming from Phoenicia. Mm-hmm. So makes perfect sense. So Phoenician, by the way, is a Semitic language. Yes. As yes. Well, yes. As as is Egyptian, the old Egyptian yeah. language. Yeah. Right. So they're Phoenician. So the Romans called. The Phoenicians, and they called the Carthaginians Punica, Punicoi, right. Punic. That comes from Poini, which comes from the Greek, mm-hmm. which is Poinike, mm-hmm. Poinike, which is what they called Phoenicia now, and they called Carthage in North Africa. It is not clear. Poinike may mean purple dye, in which case the Phoenicians are the land of the purple dye. So an exonym. So an, an exonym and Named after the trade good. Named after the trade good. Yeah. Or Foinike may be a word of unknown origin, <laughs> which then came to mean purple because, because the, that's the trade what came from di- there. the right. dye was named after the region. And it is not at all clear uh, which way it goes. Right. So certainly the word Poinike does come to mean does mean purple dye mm-hmm. and also means Phoenician. Right. But which comes first is really we don't know. And interestingly, Foinica and Poinike is the same as the word phoenix, the oh, bird. Okay. But it's unclear what exactly the relationship between those two words is, too, because the bir- the word for the bird is not obviously. It may mean blood red or purple, so it may refer to the bird being that color, but it isn't in any way clear that the bird is this, that color or is strongly associated with right. that color. So you know, the, the so things- we don't even know then what language family that word comes from. No, because it, but it is an exonym. It is definitely an exonym. Definitely an exonym. Well, it's not the word that they used for themselves. But it could have been. But it could have been a word. They it could come from Phoenician. Like right. it could have come from their own language. And it might have and been it might a word have that meant purple. purple, for instance, right. or you know, like right. this. It could have been a word that they used for something to do with mm-hmm. themselves. But it's because the word they used for themselves, though all of these things, they're attested at different times, right? So then, right. the, the, but later on, we know that the people who the Greeks called Phoenicians <laughs> called themselves Canaanites. Right. So the Semitic word Canaanim is or Kenaani is the word for themselves. Right. And that is the endonym for the people known as the Phoenicians by the Greeks. Right. And of course Canaanites we know from biblical, biblical sources. sources as mm-hmm. well, uh, but also from other textual and okay. inscriptional sources. So that would be so you know that word clearly has nothing to do with Phoenician as a word. So yeah, so the word Phoenician might be Phoenician, but it might not, might be. not be. But right. it's not Greek. This or, or, or there's no there's no obvious link for like, it's not obviously Greek either. So it's not obviously a Proto-Indo-European yeah. root there. Yeah, so it's, who knows where it's from? It's not clearly a... So mm-hmm. we don't really know where it comes mm-hmm. from. So, But it is definitely that sort of exonym. So the Punic is therefore an exonym for Carthaginians too. They would never have called themselves Punic. Right. 
it was the Punic Wars, because that's an exonym from the Romans calling them that. Right. They would have called themselves Canaanites, presumably, as well. Right. Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> well, a few other quick ones, then, of, you know, places, things that are named after the place they come from. Yeah. One we've talked about before, Turkey, mm -hmm. the bird, is in fact related to the country, mm -hmm. Turkey. Because they thought the birds came from the turkey. Just go watch the video and listen to, <laughs> listen to the podcast. It's very complicated. Yes. <laughs> and turquoise as well. Yes. So again, turquoise was thought was a... Uh, it, it was imported a, through, through Turkey. Turkey. And Europeans didn't know where it came from beyond that. So they just called it turquoise. The, the turkey the tur stone. Turkey stone. And in fact, they also used the, the term turkey stone. Yeah as well. Yeah. By the way, the word, well, the name, the country named Turkey and the Turks, uh, the origin of that is uncertain. It might have been recorded as early as 177 BCE in Chinese as Tu Kin, referring to a people living south of the Altaian Mountains. Mm -hmm. In Persian, Turk is said to mean beautiful youth, a barbarian or a robber. However, it might, in fact, come from an old Turkic root, that would make sense, which means created, strong, or lineage. Right, which, which would again, just mean would essentially people, people, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Parchment is another one that we mentioned in a video, though I guess we haven't come yeah. to that in the podcast yet. I don't yet. think so yet, no. So parchment it comes from an ancient city named Pergamon because parchment was either developed there or was imported popularized. from popularized yeah. there. It's hard to know exactly where it was developed. But anyways, it became associated to with the Greeks anyways, uh, with this particular city. Parchment being writing material made out of skins of animals. Yes. As a, an alternative to using papyrus, which is the other writing material of the ancient world. Of the ancient yeah. world. Yeah. Now, in talking about Japan and Japaning, we talked about this lacquer uh, mm -hmm. process. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at the word lacquer itself, since it's one of the main focuses there. And it comes not from a Japanese or Chinese word, but ultimately from the Indian language Sanskrit, mm -hmm. the word laksa, which referred to a red dye, not a black dye note, mm -hmm. but a red dye, which became Hindi lak. And Persian, from there, Persian lock, and that became lacra in various Romance languages, Portuguese, Spanish, French, referring to a kind of sealing wax. And from those languages, it got borrowed into English as lacquer. Meaning basically a shiny... A shiny finish. Finish, yeah. yeah. Now, the source of that Sanskrit word is somewhat debated. It might be a var variant of Sanskrit rock, and thus from Proto-Indo-European reg, meaning color or dye. That would make sense. Or, and I like this one, it might come from Sanskrit laksha, which means salmon, the fish. Hmm. Which comes from the Proto-Indo-European root lax, salmon, from which we get, get the word lox. <laughs> yep. So it's a reference to the color, salmon right, color. Right. Though I think my very favorite explanation may not be true, but I, I like it anyways, <laughs> uh, is that it in Sanskrit means literally 100,000 in reference to the large number of insects that are needed to produce produce the lock because lock is it comes from the lock insects they infest a tree in large numbers and secrete a resinous pigment which is then harvested and processed to produce shellac shellac is just a another type a of lack. yeah it's a it's a compound word from lack and the first part shell is actually shell so the lack flakes are kind of shell like in appearance when they're kind of harvested or collected or whatever shellac by the way is also used to make things like gramophone records and also in some kinds of hard candies so if you're vegan careful what hard candy you eat because it may not be it may come from animal products i think that's less likely these days than it used to be but Maybe. yeah 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 so shellac interesting is what's called a calc or loan translation. That's when you translate the individual elements literally of a sort of compound word or whatever right, right. Uh, into a new language. So it comes from the French lac en acaille, so from shell, shell mm -hmm. lac, so shellac. And the slang term to shellac, as in to beat someone soundly, probably comes from the idea to finish someone off, like because it's a finish. <laughs> okay. Right? 
I thought that was entertaining. Now, as I said at the very beginning of that voiceover, the reason that Europeans started going east in the first place was because they were after the silk and spices. So the word silk mm. is, this comes from, this is why we call this the Silk Road, the overland trade route. That's how that product made it to the West. Yeah, though the Silk Road is a very, very it, poor, is, very poor name for it. Yes. yes. And it is the whole idea of the Silk Road is now somewhat debated. But mm. in any case, early on, it carried silks from China to ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And that's the clue to the etymology of the word silk. So silk comes from Old English silk, which comes from Latin sericus, which comes from Greek sericos. Sericos is the adjective form of seres, which is the Greek name for the people from whom the goods came from. Mm -hmm presumably a group in China, and it has been suggested that the word might come from the Chinese word si, meaning silk, which is uh, in Manchurian, uh, sirga. And I, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that anywhere near correctly. <laughs> and Mo uh, Mongolian sirkek. So it may have come from the, so from the trade good to the name of a people back to the name of the trade good, which is right, a kind of interesting right, process. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. And in any case, that's a nice parallel for Japan. Another thing that uh, that Europe became really excited about uh, in terms of products from Asia was porcelain, mm -hmm. porcelain specifically of China, because Which, that's that's why it's referred to as China now as well. Right? Mm -hmm. Porcelain has the most surprising etymology, I think. It comes from Latin porcella, meaning young sow, mm -hmm. young female pig, which is the feminine diminutive of the, the word porcus, pig, thus related to our modern English word pork. Yes. So the Italian... Porcelana was also used to refer to cowrie shells, these little small, yeah. shiny, very shiny sea shells, shells yeah. seashells, probably because of the resemblance to a pig's ear. Not a pig's ear. A pig's vagina? Yes. It's surprising how much pig's vaginas matter. Um, there's an Eidolon article fairly ah. recently about sow's uteruses and vaginas and how to cook them because there are like multiple recipes for them in Roman <laughs> recipes. Wow. Sow's matrix, which is their womb and or vagina. Yes. Interesting. Yes, it is a thing. I do not know why. Go on. Well, because these cowrie shells resemble, or because porcelain resembled the shiny cowrie, sh the, the sort of finish of the shells, the name was transferred over. So you can think about that next time you eat pork off of some fine porcelain. It's mm -hmm. very appropriate. And finally, spices was the other big deal. Mm-hmm. So now you're going to tell us all the names of spices. We've got another no. three hours to go, right? I'm just going to do the word spice itself. <laughs> okay. We'll do another whole episode on spices. individual really spice should, yeah. words. So spice comes from Latin species, kind or sort. Yeah. Appearance. Yeah. Appearance. Yeah. Originally appearance. So it comes it gives from... us the word species. Yes. But it meant appearance, first appearance. of all. Thing you look yeah. at. Yeah. So it comes from Latin specchio, to see, mm -hmm. which comes from Proto-Indo-European spec, to observe. And we get a bunch of words from that species, spy, special. The plural Latin species went from meaning kind or sort to meaning goods or wares. Okay. You know, from the sense of a particular type of merchandise kind of merchandise and therefore mm -hmm. merchandise in general, and eventually narrowed in meaning further to mean just spice, because that was a common good. Particular type of good. Type of good. And this is perhaps an indication that spices were the most important trade good, you mm -hmm. know, this particular trade good. Right. Well, as they almost certainly were from yeah. certain areas anyway. Yeah. So this attests to the the extreme value of spices from Asia would have. And so therefore, contrary to popular myth, during the Middle Ages, they never used spices to hide the taste of rotten meat. Mm -hmm. It was way too expensive to waste like that. And it would, probably wouldn't work anyways. Mm -hmm. It would still taste rotten. <laughs> so People uh, who say that have never smelled rotten meat. Yeah. <laughs> Even mildly rotten meat, a little bit of slightly off chicken. There is nothing in the world that. that will disguise it. <laughs> so to coin a phrase, even a hundred thousand special trade goods can't make a silk purse out of a sow's... Well, you can pick your body part. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, I think maybe that's the note to end on. <laughs> you can think about that. I guess. <laughs> Well, all right. And with that whirlwind tour, <laughs> uh, let's stop there for tonight. 
And uh, we'll, I hope that you've enjoyed us returning to language because I know that we've had quite a few episodes that were more about the history and other things. You sure got a lot of language we this got time. got a lot of language this time. I think we do a very bad job of re- remembering to mention that the, the, the point behind our podcast, our theory is that it's interesting connections around the world to things. And therefore, we see ourselves as being able to talk about anything we want because everything's connected. <laughs> um, so if you like the podcast for language, I hope we've satisfied you. If you've come to the podcast recently for history, never fear. We will be back to history there's as well. Some history there. And we definitely <laughs> do have more interviews coming up because they're so much fun. Yes. Uh, we really do enjoy talking to people, but we want to sort of spread ourselves between our various approaches to topics. So... I feel like we asked some questions. If we did hours ago when we started this podcast, (laughs) please uh, send in your answers. You can reach us on Twitter or by email or by commenting on the podcast website itself. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll return soon. Actually, we do know what we're going to talk about next time, don't we? We do, because April April Fool's Fool's is coming coming up. up. So there'll be some cocktails in the (laughs) near future. I think. And some discussion of jokes. And some tomfoolery. Indeed. So until then, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.